for joining us today for the fifth episode of the Resistant Bureau, a program that spotlights issues around democracy and the struggle for freedom in Africa. I am your host, Mandatim Loja. We're also joined by Dr. Christine Sheng, who's going to moderate our public question and answer session to close out this show. Please send us your questions on WhatsApp by using our WhatsApp number, plus 263 776 238 199. Plus 263 776 238 199. You can also follow the discussion via Twitter on at Resist Bureau and also use the hashtag Resist Bureau Live. But we're also live streaming on Facebook Live and YouTube. This show is also being recorded for data distribution. So basically, we know that the world is an unequal, an unequal place for women and girls, especially women of color and for women who are in the LGBTQIA plus community, as well as disabled women. Even in established democracies such as the UK and the United States of America, women are underrepresented in leadership, in parliament and in the, in the cabinet. They earn less money than their male counterparts and are much more likely to suffer gender-based violence and be the target of hate speech. In Africa, a combination of existing attitudes towards power and authority combined with the misogynistic practices introduced by colonial powers means that the challenges are particularly more in the continent. Rwanda may have the highest number of women in parliament and compared to other countries in the world, but women still make up less than 10% of MPs in parliament, such as Botswana and Nigeria. And in many other countries, the law actively discriminates against women in the workplace and is also very blind to widespread domestic violence where impunity often prevails. To be sure, the COVID-19 pandemic is now so, uh, it has actually increased the situation. The outbreak has worsened the already gaping inequalities among women uh, from across the world and in every sphere from health and the economy to security and social protection. Even before the pandemic, a 2019 study concluded that political violence against women had actually reached some of the highest levels ever recorded. The study also found that gender-based violence, namely abductions and forced disappearances of women, are especially widespread in Africa. Nevertheless, we've got amazing women leaders that are standing up to this repression and the patriarchal structures and attitudes for generations. This has been no different. We need action. We need urgent action to prevent the current situation from having a lasting effect on our fight for women's rights. Joining us today for our show are amazing female panelists from across Africa, women that are resisting Kutrak in helping us end this pandemic of repression against women. So I'm just going to run through their bios. I mean, when I say amazing women, they are, they are really fighting for women in their different countries. We've got, De we've got Dr. Leila Hudson, a Somalian-born psychotherapist who devoted her life to, to the life boldly tackling issues of female genital mutilation and gender equality. She's the founder of several projects that seek to make the world a safer and fairer place for women and girls. Her current project, The Girl Generation, supports the emotional well-being of activists working with survivors of female genital mutilation. She's the recipient of many prestigious awards, including the 2010 Cosmo Cosmopolitan Ultimate Campaigner Women of the Year Award, and has been recognized as one of the UK's most influential people. We also have Zenaida Machado, who is currently the Angola and Mozambique Research and Human Rights Watch, formerly a journalist working with flagship BBC programs such as Focus on Africa and Newswork. Her career included working for Radio Mozambique and establishing the, the station's first new website. All told, she has over 20 years of experience, bravely and boldly highlighting human rights violations in Southern Africa, with a particular focus on different countries. We also have Stella Nyanzi, who is one of Africa's most outspoken and fearless voices of change. She recently spent 18 months in prison for publicly criticizing Ugandan long ruling dictator Yoweri Museveni. Her defiance has helped to activate and inspire other pro democracy and pro feminist activists across the region. Trained as a medical anthropologist, she's also well regarded as a scholar on sexualities, public health, and LGBTQ rights. Among many of her honors, she has received what has been called the 2020 Ox Oxfam Novit Pen International Award for Freedom of Expression. And lastly, we've got ba Mbalin Duli, a South African independent and fiercely free speaking politician and a leading voice within the Democratic Alliance, the country's main opposition party. A member of the Guazulu Natal legislature, she is well regarded as one of the most outspoken female leaders in the country. Currently, she's campaigning to be the next elected leader 
of the Democratic Alliance. Ladies, thank you so much for joining us. As I said earlier, you are all amazing and I'm really inspired by all of you. So Dr. Leila, I'm going to start engaging you first because a lot of your work centers really around female genital mutilation. And if you're to understand patriarchy and actually want to work towards resisting it, I think it's very much important that we understand that it's not just an elderly woman type of experience, but it's actually entrenched in the childhood of, of our girls and actually consistent across, across their world lives. So in a global citizen publication in February 2010, you write about how you had no idea that you were a female genital mutilation survivor until a nurse asked you during a, a routine screening. Building on your experience with women who've undergone similar experiences, help us as the audience to understand that beyond just the female genital mutilations, what are some of the manifestations of patriarchy that potentially explain the way that girls and women in Africa respond to violations, not just sexual, but also how it influences how they grow into or away from spaces where their voices matter. So Dr. Leila, please lead us. Just realize I'm muted, I'm here. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, for one, I'm really uh, excited to be on this panel. Um, I think if we go back a little bit, sometimes even when we talk about African women, in many panels, you don't see African women on the panel. So I think it's really important to acknowledge that when we are talking about us, there has to be a reflection of us in these spaces. So I think this is, that, that needs to be acknowledged. Um, I think the way, why, the way we respond, I think, I, and I will speak as a psychotherapist, my background, I, mean, I work in mental health and I study human behavior. I think what's really interesting specifically around female genital mutilation is we, the language we use for one. Because when we talk about FGM, mm -hmm. we say culture, tradition, religion, but if you picture for one for a few seconds, you're grabbing a child, you're pinning a child on a table, you're spreading their legs apart. Forget about the cutting, touching their genitalia. In the other part of the world, that would never be acceptable. So there's a form of conditioning and grooming psychologically with African people that's happened. The idea that we think this is traditional and cultural itself is very damaging. Grooming people to, to that mental state it's extremely abusive. And I think we really need to understand that because when we are say, when we are responding with, this is our culture, this is our religion, you have to look back and think, why are they feeling that way? So there is that state of mind where we are conditioned into such a way. So language is absolutely key because we, when we are talking about white children, the world will be violent, abuse. But when it comes to children of color, black children, African children, girls specifically, it's culture, it's tradition. And, and it's not just FGM, actually, I would like to. FGM is just a little part of how we are oppressing women's bodies and sexuality, because fundamentally, that's why it happens. But if we think about the word child marriage, for example, it's the, there's no marriageable about a child. Again, this is part of the grooming. All of us, how many of us work in development in these spaces and we use the word child marriage over and over again? Because when you say the word marriage, you're saying it's a little bit okay. Because what's happening to our girls, our black African girls, they're being raped by adult men. If, that, if you put that context of a white girl, the word would be rape. So as Africans, we really need to start reflecting the languages we're using when we are talking about our own children. And I keep saying children because FGM does not happen to older women. It happens to a child. The moment you do that to a child, and, and remember what I just described earlier about cutting children, it doesn't happen privately. It's public. It's very humiliating experience. So FGM is not a cultural, traditional, religious practice. It's one of the worst forms of sexual assaults against children. And it's publicly done to children. So imagine psychologically what, would, what that would do to the adult woman. Of course, they're not going to respond. This is violent because it's done so publicly. So I don't expect... Uh, 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 anyone to accept this as a form of abuse. So we really need to go back a little bit. In we need to understand why we frame FGM within that context. So my job has been over the years, not as an activist, as a survivor myself, I have a daughter, but I'm also an expert in this field. I'm working with women in a clinical setting where I'm really trying to understand the behavior. We really need to start changing the language we use when we are talking about violence against women, especially black African women and children, because I am telling you, we use a whole different language and the, la the language itself is so powerful. It, the, the approach becomes different because the moment you say it's cultural, 
Let's talk to, I mean, I'm sick and tired of hearing the word. Let's talk to community leaders and religious leaders. Yet again, why are we negotiating our girls' bodies with men who hold the patriarchal system? Do you see how messed up this sounds when you really look at it within that context? And that's been the problem. So we can never get to the solution until we actually acknowledge how this patriarchal system is actually set that FGM actually does continue. FGM will continue until we, we don't acknowledge the foundation. FGM is not separated from patriarchal system. FGM is not separated from violence against women and girls. FGM is that, it's all of that. So the moment we stop treating this practice this violence as a separate issue, we'll, we will respond to it much better. So again, what I would like to encourage all of, and I'm sure the, the rest of, I will, I will love to hear what the, the rest of the panelists think, but there's this attitude when we are talking about the female black child's body, there's a whole different rule. When COVID happened, my heart sank because I said globally, the black female child was the one most at risk globally. The most high risk person is the black female child and COVID happened it, it, it was devastating because I thought what will happen to those girls and I the girls I work with are in that category but the language that we're using has to change because that's the only way we're going to change the approach and our girls deserve they deserve we deserve they deserve to be acknowledged as people who were violated we can't keep saying what you've been through was cultural oh it's child marriage no it's it's abuse it's pedophilia we are talking about a pedophilia behavior. So we need to question ourselves, why are we using that language for black girls and not for white girls? I know, even if you look at FGM in the, in, in the West, it, it exists, but we use the term design a vagina. You would never use uh, female genital mutilation. If you actually look at the procedures, it's very similar. So we really need to start questioning how, what language, and that leads to how we approach it. Sorry, that was a very long response. <laughs> No, that's okay. Actually, it's very comprehensive. It actually answers some, like the next question that I was going to ask. But then mm -hmm. I'm coming back to the issue of culture, how you are pressing the idea that we tend to use a language that justifies it. And I think coming back to Africa, there's a tendency to think that when we start addressing these cultural practices as some form of abuse, there is this notion that we are importing Western culture and therefore threatening the African culture. So the biggest question that we have mm. is now, how do we bring it down to Africa and also still manage to maneuver this environment where when you bring in something like this, the question comes yeah. in to say you're bringing a foreign culture. But do you know what's, what makes me sad? That we assume something that's, that's, that's kind to children is Western. That's always my response. Why are we assuming not harming our children is a Western concept? I'm a very proud African. I love my culture. I love how we, when we, you know, our food, our dancing, hospitality, you know, how we welcome people. We love our children. But why is it, or why do we always respond with, it's a West, and by the way, in the West, children are violated too, except they actually get the acknowledgement for being violated. It's not, violence is not an Africa issue. It's a global issue. So as Africans, we need to ask ourselves, why do we always respond in that way when an African like me and says, our children will not be violated. I don't care which part of the world you're from. But the response is always, you're bringing a Western view. My kindness and love comes from my mother's house, who's an African woman. I grew up in the West, yes, but that doesn't mean the West is also perfect. So we really need to question ourselves why we respond in that way. But again, that goes back to the conditioning. It's the idea as an African, there's a fear of having something from the West. And there's a reason for that because the West, you know, due to slavery and colonization, we have a real reason to be scared of what the West is bringing to us. So we have to acknowledge that too. But we need to be very careful where we're crossing the lines here because our children are being publicly violated. I'd never heard of a case where a white girl was mutilated publicly in front of everybody. Never heard of such a thing. Never. But it's okay for our girls that look like us are violating and we're calling it culture. We need to reflect on that as Africans. We actually, I would like to encourage people, let's start creating safe spaces where we can have a conversation where we can say this. Thank you so much, Dr. Leila. I think this is where I would want to bring in Dr. Stella Nyanze to say that we want to speak truth to power and you're one woman that really has been speaking truth to power. You've now been arrested several times for speaking truth to power and in an article from July in the Mail and Garden it talks about why Uganda needs a Stella Nyanze in parliament. It argues that if the edifice of 
um, that supports patriarchal system in Uganda shows signs of dents and bruises, then definitely it is actually because of a one woman campaign by Stella Nyanzi, which is putting women at the center of spaces from which they've been marginalized. So maybe I want, us, you, I want you to tell us, the audience, more about your arrests, including maybe a reflection of the recent one this weekend and how this treatment really reflects the discomfort of gatekeepers of patriarchy, especially when women like you call them out. Dr. Stella, are you there? Please unmute yourself and then respond. Ah, yes, the unmute button. So um, I was saying, hi, hi, that when you invite me to talk about my arrests, it's very difficult for me to do that because I've been arrested so many times. Which one do you want to, 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 to hear about? I was arrested this weekend. Um, in my country and I was found in my car with my political assistant and my photographer and my driver and we were all dragged to a police station where we stayed over the weekend and we after shouting ourselves hoarse we were released but my we were taken to court and released on court bail and my question was what crime have I done I'm a Ugandan in Uganda and I was told I had disobeyed COVID-19 directives um, because I was found in Busia. Busia is a border district. But to answer your question about gatekeepers and speaking truth to power, I want to say that because we are women, many times we are considered second-class citizens. And so a woman is not assumed to have power or voice or a brain or the ability to articulate anything worth being listened to. I think that um, when Layla was speaking, she talked about socialize, she talked about grooming and how children are conditioned and how our societies are conditioned to believe that it's okay for women, for girls to be violated publicly. And I think that a lot of us have been socialized to accept our positions of silence, to, 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 to accept that it's okay simply because she is a girl or she is a woman, she will not take up space, she will not have power, she cannot think for herself, she cannot decide for herself. If anything, her body is there to be determined what to be done with by men. But also sometimes the gatekeepers are adult women who have been socialized to normalize this violence. And, and, and it's amazing how things that are very abnormal and absurd and inhuman, in fact, they dehumanize us as as human beings, because we are African, we are women, we are girls, but we are human. You know, at the core of what we are, we are human. We may be cultural beings, but we're still human. And the idea that, that kindness and humanity and uh, pain and vulnerability and life and access to these are Western or it's foreign influence, like it's how, ew, how dare we accept to be denigrated so much i come from africa from uganda we believe in ubuntu ubuntu is that communal spirit that says we are spirit before we are anything and therefore we are human um and and many times the gatekeepers are scandalized when we insist on pointing out the abnormal to say it is not okay because she is a girl and she is black and often she's also poor, okay? So if she's poor, nobody will use their privilege to speak for that poor child. It's as if we have our own elite circles where women NGOs and feminists and women elite are busy doing things for those women who are clean and girls who are as wealthy and in their same classes. But if she's dirty and poor and black and rural, Nobody wants to use their privilege and position and power to speak for them, okay? And so I think that many times the gatekeepers, the animals, the oppressors are not just old men who are religious and cultural and uh, con conservative. Very many times it's also fellow women yeah. who have sadly been socialized to accept that it is okay. Many times because I, so I, I, I want to talk about culture because I studied anthropology. My PhD is in medical anthropology and we must debunk all the time the idea that our cultures are static, that they are fixed in cement 
They are solid, they cannot change. Cultures are not things. Our traditions, our customs are malleable, they change, we shape them. And I think as women with influence, we have the ability, I have tested this and seen it, we have the ability to reshape our cultures, to refashion them in ways that make meaning for women and girls, particularly those who are underprivileged and poor. That's one point I wanted to say, that culture, whether it's African or Western, is not set in stone. And I, 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 I like to tinker with it, to reimagine for others what it is like for an African culture that values who we are as women. And I celebrate our culture because a lot of it is very empowering for women, I feel. Um, I also want to say that there are a few traditional practices that are harmful and we must acknowledge that. And we must be able to speak unapologetically as Africans to condone uh, what is good, but to condemn and name and shame that which is evil to our 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 ourselves our children our daughters our granddaughters and so while they're gatekeepers that side i celebrate all those women who decide to get keep in feminist ways in in healthy ways in in healing ways um um i, I wanted to talk about politics a little bit because i think that particularly those of us who are participating now in national politics we are able to touch the helm of power to change things at a national level using policies and programs that can influence entire cultures in Africa, uh, entire society. And that it is important when we get into realms of power, whether as political po politicians or protesters or educated masses or professionals, that we use that privilege to, 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 to redeem redefine safety and, and, and health um, for young girls, especially now in the COVID-19 times when very many of us who have privilege are abusing it with those who oppress the nation. And so it is unfortunate that there are very many women in our countries in Africa who are sitting with the oppressors of girls and women, women in government who are keeping quiet when I governments are stealing that which should belong to underprivileged women and, and girls. And, and it's shameful if we don't call them out and say, you sit in government, you have vaginas like we do, but you're not using your vaginas for the good of other women and girls. Um, it's not enough to just be a woman in power. Use that power to, 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 to effect change for all women, but also all underprivileged people, such as transgender women, many times they are invisible from this discourse. And so when Leila says she celebrates that African bodies are here and present talking about things about African women, it's also good for us to acknowledge those who are invisible. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, you're speaking of politics and I think it's very important that we bring in Balinduli as a legislator herself. I think um, being a legislator in South Africa, you may have had a good share of misogyny or at least castigation from women. Maybe you can share with us some of the ways in which women have dragged other women down, especially women that have rose into politics and also how we can positively as women actually push forward this idea of women's rights and also try to keep this idea of a, of a patriarchal society. So what has been your experience as a woman in politics? Thanks, and thanks for having me. And I feel very honored to be um, on this panel with so many esteemed women. But you know, just before I answer your question, I also just want to have a brief comment on what's been said by both Leila and um, Stella. And for me, obviously, as somebody who's in politics, it's such a fine line sometimes when we have to discuss what culture is. And although I also believe that culture is not static, it's very different to people who still live in for example, in my country, under communal land, under chiefs, under indunas, who are still seen to be the people that are the symbolism of the community leaders. And so when you have conversations, and for us, it might not be FGM, it might be things like virginity testing, or it might be 
um, initiation schools where little boys are also sexually assaulted as far as I'm concerned, where they have to have uh, their foreskins um, cut off. You have a huge uproar and that, as you said before, people believe that you've become very Western, it's become a very Eurocentric way of looking down on our culture. And that becomes incredibly difficult, I think, in the political realm, because as much as you want to give people the autonomy to be able to make decisions of their own and their own bodily rights and integrity, children aren't able to do that, but their parents can. And you risk being able to offend people who genuinely believe that they're doing something that culturally means something significant to them because virginity testing is not seen from the purely patriarchal prism of actually policing women's bodies and having some idea of women's purity being linked to their sexuality or their virginity. It's seen as something that is morally keeping children from you know, being promiscuous and um, indulging in unsafe sex practices. And in a country with the most HIV um, in the world, it becomes such a conflation of issues that you almost are unable to tell people that this is still a form of sexual assault. This is still harmful to young people and is actually allowing them to grow up thinking that people do have access to their bodies whenever they want. And then you see what we have in the rest of my society, which is the highest uh, rape rate outside of any war country in the entire world. And you can see, as Dr. Leila was saying, that these things started a very... Um, small level and eventually escalates into the way that the society normalizes violence and particularly violence against women. And again, just in the country that has had apartheid and baby 27 years ago, we are still trying to grapple with what is Eurocentric and Western and foreign to us and that we definitely can't take as being part of what we believe as, you know, indigenous African people, whether it's that we reject organized religion and go back to our African spirituality. And what is actually incredibly important for us to realize is sexual assault and the way that it is defined in the world and the way that we see um, is harming children in our, in, our, in our country. And for me, certainly in politics, and next week I'm actually arguing and debating in the legislature about the traditional bills court which basically in its original form would have stripped any woman from being able to have any kind of land or any kind of say, even if they had hereditarily been passed down by their parents. Uh, because people didn't take into cognizance that women are autonomous beings and would want to be able to use their own um, land and not have to ask a male uh, relative or their father or their brother. And so we still, particularly in South Africa, are still dealing with a lot of these issues. But when it comes to what I've experienced, certainly I think that there's incredible amounts of patriarchy still, and it's seen in the sexualized nature of our politics. It's seen in how you can't talk about it because then you aren't tough and you aren't supposed to be in the political realm if you do, because then you obviously can't take the heat. But even now, as I run for the leader of the second biggest party in the country, people are asking me about how I'm going to balance being a mother, whereas the person that I'm running against has three children one who's also incredibly young. And so it still comes across in very little ways that you are fighting a mountain in terms of trying to normalize that women should be in these spaces and women should rearrange what these spaces look like. So a lot of the conversations that I'm trying to bring up is how would this world look different if you had women leaders that had the power to actually change what everything looks like? Not having you know, um, meetings at the golf club or after hours when a person who is considered the primary caregiver can't always be there, which excludes them from the decision that gets taken outside of the boardrooms. Um, and so it's been a really interesting journey trying to get those decisions. And of course, what I've been labeled as is negative and aggressive and wanting to uh, go against my party and attack my party. But it's something that we have to be comfortable doing, I think, as more and more of us try to get into these particular spaces because like many of the women on this panel before me did, um, those are just the kind of bullets we're gonna have to take to get to where we want to. But I think it's still incredibly patriarchal in many ways. Um, and I certainly think that it's a barrier for more young women to come in. And so we boast the South Africa that we have a high number of female representatives, but they really come through a party system which has got a lot of political justing that happens behind. Women who are social activists that would want to be in parliament really have no access to that unless they're willing to play the party political game. And I'm very pleased to say that at least our constitutional court has decided that 
within two years, South Africa will be allowed to have independent candidates that can run outside of um, party politics. And I hope that that's going to see more women being able to access the political realm and being able to run. Okay, thank you so much, Mbali. Um, you raised the, uh, you actually went straight into the other question that I would have asked you, which is really around sexual violence in South Africa. I think South Africa is, if not the top country that is often breaking the news for, it's a woman that got beaten, it's a woman that disappeared, it's a woman that showed up dead, things like that. So really the question that I want to ask centers around the idea that society has moved towards blaming the victim. When it's a woman, you're asked, what were you wearing? What did you say for him to beat you? And things like that, which is very problematic. But then we're also looking at the COVID-19 environment. How do you think this pandemic has come out, worsened this situation? And what can be done, especially at policy level, to kind of maneuver this and allow women to actually feel that they are not to blame for some of these experiences that they're having to go through? A very shocking stat that I read a few days ago is that due to the COVID lockdown, more young girls between the ages, between grade five to grade seven, have actually had pregnancy rates increase, which just shows you that even in the home, these young girls are not safe. And in fact, most of their sexual violence is coming from people that they know. And there's so many different issues that come into understanding the the history of sexual violence in South Africa, everything from the fact that patriarchy doesn't just affect women, it also affects men. And men who have been emasculated by 400 years of colonial rule, 27 or years into democracy, still haven't been able to get themselves out of the shackles that apartheid threw them in. And this is not to excuse their behavior, but it's to understand the complete rage that men are walking around, not being able to do what patriarchy has told them as their only role, which is to be able to provide and is able to be you know, functional members of society. But how do they do that when they have no access to those opportunities? And I think until we as a country are able to tackle many of these issues from different places, understanding that men in, the, in a really big way are just as much victims as patriarchy as women are, we aren't going to have any resolution, we're going to speak past each other and we're going to continue to try and educate girls and women about how to be safe and you know, how to try and not be victims, which is the wrong tact, but is what people are doing out of desperation, rather than actually dealing with the societal issues that have gotten us here. And the prime, the prime uh, I think, issues are really that men themselves are not given the spaces. And I think in terms of legislation, we really have to be looking at trying to have programs and trying to have um, mechanisms to try and get men just as aware of their roles and their ability to be vulnerable and to understand their own self-awareness in terms of the psychology that they're going through. Um, whilst of course dealing with the fact that we need to have safe spaces for women, we need to have shelters, we need to understand that because women economically are unable to get away from abusers, they feel trapped in those situations and there are so many ways that we have best practice around the world that we could legislate that into being. And certainly one of the things I've been talking about is shelters where women can leave and can actually have assistance until they're able to get back on their feet. But again, in a country that has 50% unemployment, you're trying to solve a lot of different issues at once. But this is something that I think if we are not able to fundamentally solve is going to continue the cycle of violence that we're seeing in my country. Thank you so much, Mbali. Uh, I want to bring in uh, Zenaida into this because um, recently there was a video that was making rounds on Twitter of a woman, a naked woman, who was beaten and executed by military men. And in this video, she's accused of being part of the Al-Shabaab. Um, this is an Islamic insurgent group that has been operating in the north of Mozambique since 2017. But I think that there is generally minimum understanding of the situation in Mozambique, particularly how it affects women. So maybe Zenaida, you can come in and kind of give us the context of what's happening in Mozambique right now and how it particularly affects women. Um, thank you so much for that um, and for using the platform to highlight the, the, the issue in Northern Mozambique. Um, I think before we even discuss the problem of terrorism or any other issues that are affecting Mozambique at the, at the moment, it's important to note that as any African country, Mozambique was already dealing with the issues that have been raised by Leila and um, Bali and Stella, uh, where 
women are, are seen as second class citizens, where it reminds me some few days ago when I switched on the television to see a discussion about women. And here we have five men and one woman in the panel. And I kept wondering, how are they discussing women like that? Um, and, and this goes over and over over the years. And uh, with anything that happens in Mozambique, and it wasn't different with the video, the reactions to the video, sometimes they shock me. I will still see women on social media wondering what did that woman do for the soldiers or alleged soldiers to treat her like that? I mean, even if she was part of the so-called Al-Shabaab, she still had the right to be treated um, as, a, as a person that has right, um, as, a, as, a, as a suspect. And even if he was considered guilty by a court of law, she still deserved a, a minimal dignity. So for those who have not watched the video, let me briefly explain what we can see on it. Uh, there is a woman naked walking on a deserted road and men in uniform, uh, arm uniform, uh, following the woman. And uh, one of the men approaches her with a stick and starts beating her in the head and in parts of her body. She cries, shouts, tries to run away from them. The man asks everybody to move away. And suddenly another man starts firing at the woman. He fires a gunshot in her head. She still resists to that gunshot and continues to walk. And the other men in the group, them, all of them hold their AK-47s and in, start firing all of them in the execution style towards the women. It's estimated that they might have fired over 30 uh, bullets at the women. They then leave her to drop on the ground, on the floor. One of them shouts, asking the, the rest of the group to stop firing. It's enough, it's enough, it's enough, it's enough, finish, finish, it's enough. And then they turn their backs and start walking away from the place. And one of the men, a young man, then takes a selfie of himself and shouts, we have just killed al Shaba." Um, the reaction of the government on that video so far has been to deny that the men in, in the video are soldiers. My point has always been that regardless of who the executors are, that woman deserves some dignity and respect. We need to know who she is. It's been two weeks, we don't know who that woman is. She's a mother, she's an auntie, she's a sister, she's a daughter to somebody in the Mozambican territory. And uh, I don't want to even imagine what our children are thinking if they had the chance to watch that movie and see how their mother was killed brutally, allegedly by those who were supposed to protect them. And that's why they wear uniforms. Now, the video is shocking, true. The video is revealing, that's true, but it's not surprising to me personally, because over the years we have documented other similar cases. I remember early in 2017, when we visited Malawi, the border with Mozambique, area where thousands of Mozambique that flee the conflict then between the government forces and the opposition, um, the Renamo, that we met um, women who had been sexually abused by soldiers on their way to Malawi. Uh, one of them, a testimony still stays in my mind because she described the sexual abuse and I kept asking her whether there had been any penetration and she denied. And from her description, 
the event had taken place about five months before the interview. And there she was in front of me, pregnant of what appeared to be a five months pregnancy. So there are high chances that she could be carrying a baby that belongs to a soldier somewhere that raped her on her way to seeking refuge. And she will have to carry and raise that child and uh, try her best to make of that child a, a, a normal citizen of this country. Uh, over the years, I've also documented cases where women have been forced to offer themselves as a price in exchange of aid. Uh, a recent case was when the cyclone Idai struck Mozambique, where women were the most affected, of course, because they make the large part of the population. And I don't know why we seem to forget that anytime there is a crisis, that the numbers don't change because there is a cyclone, because there is a war. Women are still the majority. Women are still the most affected by poverty. And of course, they will be the most affected by the crisis that is in place. So in the case of Cyclone Idai, it happened to have hit an area where there's a huge number of unemployment, uh, a large number of cases of prostitution, and one of the highest um, uh, indexes of child marriage. So girls were given away to older men because parents could not take care of them anymore after the cyclone. After the cyclone, um, the distribution of aid was given to, the, I mean, the lead, leadership of the distribution of aid was mostly men. And women had to beg to those men to have access to food, basic food, aid, again. And in some cases, they had to give them some sexual favors in exchange for one kg of beans, one kg of rice that they could take and feed their children. I remember one particular case that I had a chance to, to document of a woman who was very angry telling me on the phone, like, do you know how many times I slept with him? And then he just brings me here 10 kg of rice. What am I going to do with 10 kg of rice? And uh, as I was speaking to other people, even from the civil society, the reaction I would get shameful though, was that, oh, but you know women in that area, they're used to that. It's an area of, of prostitution, they're used to that. And, 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 I, and I, I, I would struggle to understand why is it normal for people to accept that a woman needs to offer any sexual favor in exchange for food. Um, Speaking still of uh, Cap Delgado, the video focused on the case of that woman that was, a, that was a brutally killed by the alleged soldier. But we know that also in Cap Delgado, women have been raped by the insurgents. Women have been kidnapped. We recently had a case of two reverend sisters who were released after they had been kidnapped by insurgents. And we are here to know what happened to them during the time that they were in, in captivity. So it's not surprising that women are suffering. What surprises me at this stage is that in 2020, after as Africans, we have signed so many agreements on women empowerment, we still have to deal with cases like this that makes you feel like you were somewhere in the 40th or 15th century. Thank you so much, Zenaida. I think that was very, very comprehensive. And I just want to move over to Dr. Christine for a question and answer session. Um, she's a lecturer from King's College who's an expert on both conflict and gender and marriage academia with activism. So Christine, maybe you can tell us how some of your work um, has to do with some of the variable issues that have been raised today, but also share some of the questions that we've got from our audience for the panel. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a, an honor, actually, to be 
invited along to this conversation. And I've really been inspired by the things that all of my fellow panelists have been talking about. There are issues that are very close to my heart and that I've been fighting for for a long time um, in different ways. So I primarily work on conflict in Africa. And so many of the things that are being discussed here today apply to you know the parts of of Africa that I work on. So I mostly work on West Africa, Liberia specifically, um, but also you know, just around the region following all African politics. But the other part of me is also an activist at home. I believe that you, know, you should fight for the things that you believe in and I think you should do it at home in your personal life as well. So I'm active in, in British politics here and uh, I, I do that at the national level and I try and change policy um, in these in these kinds of ways dealing with gender issues. So I'm coming at this with with two hats on. One is my you know African conflict hat and then the other one is my gender activism hat. And just thinking about all of the things that you've talked about, it's a an incredibly deep and thoughtful and nuanced approach to the issues, right? That I think all of you have have spanned. And there are a few things that I think have come through here that um, run through your comments. So I think the first one is actually about political activism and thinking about how how do we do that thing of changing that culture of patriarchy that, that Stella brought up. And I think that was a nice way of framing it, right? Because there's always change in society. And the question is, how long does it take to achieve that change? And then how far people are willing to go in order to enact that kind of change? And at what point, and how do you get to that tipping point of trying to convince enough people to turn something into a social movement and then to turn that social movement into a political goal that is clear enough for enough of the population to actually rally around? And, and there have to be multiple things going on at the same time, but how, how that is constructed is, is really, really difficult from what I've seen. And, and you can have things build up and then sort of die away. Um, and then in other cases, it gets sustained. And I think the question to me is, how do you build that up successfully? And then how do you get that sustained momentum? So if you're thinking about Black Lives Matters, for example, um, around the world, you know, at different moments, at different points in different places around the world, it has resonated with particular parts of particular populations and then died away and then come back for various reasons, right? So how do you create the political conditions to make that actually get traction in both the policy world and then also in terms of building a political party so that women can take more of those seats and more of that power. And I wanted to really direct that to the women who are actually you know, running for office, so Stella and, and Bali. I think both of you are in excellent positions to talk about um, how that can be done. I have a different set of questions just thinking about the, um, the role of men and boys in this conversation, which, is, which has come up a few times. And I think you know several of you have said this, and, and I think it's exactly right. You can't really have this conversation just with women. And it's it took me a long time to realize that. I think it took me about a decade to realize that, that the people who actually have power have to be convinced that it's in their interest to some extent to share that power. Um, and to make this conversation sort of slightly topical, um, the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, I was listening to a podcast about how she had changed over time and evolved as, as a woman and her feminist thought. And I hadn't realized how much that had changed over time. But it was that the secret to her success in many ways was to convince men that they would benefit from uh, a different set of openings in the patriarchy, that they needed more roles in their society and that they were entitled to those roles. And that that was the way of entrenching gender equality. It was a really, really different way of framing it that I hadn't, I hadn't really previously appreciated. And I just wonder if that might be a different way of, of going about things that um, we need to sort of we need to think in multiple ways, not just about women's discourses, but also how women's discourses interact with those of men. And then what do men's discourses look like? And that speaks to, I guess, a final question that, that Zanaida and, and Leila might want to consider, um, just around norms of violence. You know, this is something that I'm working on with my next research project that's funded by the British government. Um, it's looking at trauma and wartime violence. And the big question that's always, been at the back of my mind when I did my, my work in Liberia and then spent time in South Africa and lots of places around the world in, in thinking about violence and conflict is how do we create these norms of violence and why are these norms of violence so different um, against 
against women than they are against men, against boys than they are against girls? And how do we end up socializing ourselves to accept the kind of violence that, that Zenaida described in that video as being acceptable, right? That 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 takes a, a culture, a kind of socialization that we all agree with. And this is not exclusive to Africa. I mean, this is right around the world, right? This is everywhere. How do we how do we get to this place where that becomes okay, right? And then how do we undo those norms of violence? How do we change those social norms? I think that's a that's a really tough question, and and I'm not sure what the answer is, right? I'm 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 genuinely curious what you guys think about how we go about doing this in terms of changing the culture. I mean, I've left you with with you know some some hard things to deal with. And then I've got two more hard questions for you coming from the audience. So the first one is directed at, at Stella. So with the upcoming Ugandan elections and the Museveni dictatorship doing all it can to stay entrenched in power, what are the prospects for any semblance of a free and fair vote in February? And what role can women leaders like you play to ensure that Ugandans voices, especially those of women who make up the voting majority are actually heard and respected? And then the second question is for Zenaida. Um, and this, this, um, this person writes, I saw the shock, recent shocking video of the woman being executed in Mozambique. It was horrific. And I have to imagine that it's not an isolated incident. Now, I know you've already said a bit about this, but if you could just say a little bit more Zenaida, what can you tell us about the way in which women are being disrespected and violated um, further in Mozambique? But the question here really is, why isn't this getting more attention both at the regional level and then within the leadership and you know more broadly internationally. Thanks. Actually, maybe we can start with, I'm just gonna call on you. So maybe Stella, we could start off with, um, with some answers or anything that you feel like you want to address here. Uh, you don't have to tackle everything. Um, and then I'll go to Mbali and then uh, Leila and then Zenaida. Right, so um, amazing input from, from the panelists, but also interesting how you have drawn the threads for us, Christine. Um, you, you ask about political activism and um, how one can build a social movement, perhaps, that, that fights against this culture of patriarchy. And then you're asking one, how do we build it up? But two, how does one successfully sustain it? Very difficult questions. I think they're not difficult just only from the abstract theoretic academic sort of terrain, but also the, the, the practicality and the praxis of building movements are against historical entrenchment of oppression. For minorities, um, how 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 one does that successfully is 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 a serious question. The answers for me, I think, are there, and we must not shy away from getting them. Particularly those of us who believe we are feminists, because feminism is really about us making some change. So just about leveling ourselves. I think, I think um, drawing very much from the Black Lives Matters movement, but also several other movements. I think, I think the queer movement in Africa, which also has been greatly oppressed um, and, and also greatly opposed. I, I think for me, one of the, the strategies we can use is intersectionality, meaning that there are a number of forms of oppression, different minority groups can, first of all, see the oppression of, of women and girls as their own, as a reflection of their own oppression. The idea that we can allow other minorities, other oppressed groups to see how our oppression as women and girls, our gender, um, how that hierarchy of patriarchy means that we are at the bottom is reflected in how they too are oppressed and then how we form and join hands together I think for me is one way of doing it such that it's not left only to just women and girls but also that we have allies and so you you were asking about the role of men and boys I think part of ways in which we can 
build movements is to tap from those with power, those who are the so-called named oppressors, um, and, 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 and to show how they can ally with us. Maybe the, the, the second question where you refer to, 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 to the Lech professor um, highlights how it's important to show them their benefits. Many times when I'm delegating part of the struggle we do as, 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 as feminists, I delegate to men with power. I have alliances and allies and uh, comrades who are men with power. And when we are attacked or arrested for doing our feminist work, they will come and bail us out. Um, but also when it's racial and it's Ugandan women, many times we have used white or brown women in embassies to come and work as our shields. And so our alliances are working with other powerful others who can protect us, sometimes in really amazing unexpected ways. How does one, I mean, the, the work of building movements is very tiring. <laughs> it also gets very boring, especially when the oppressor does not shift, the oppression does not shift. But also patriarchy has an interesting way of, be, of, of reinventing itself and becoming super cool and, and learning the language of the time and, and, and even entering spaces like the internet where it's, it's, you know, the internet is a new terrain, but we still find oppression of women and girls by toxic masculinities and, and, and hot tips and you know, all these highly hot-blooded heterosexual homophobes. Um, and, and, and so patriarchy reinvents itself. We have to keep reinventing our struggle, I feel. Um, I will go, I mean, I haven't done a very good job, but I'm thinking yes, because I, I think the feminist movement that I belong to has gone through phases of vigor and then it slackens and then it dies away and then something comes up and it reawakens. It's, it's very much uh, waves and waves. How one sustains the highs or keeps them for as long as possible is an important question. I don't have an answer, sorry, Christine. Maybe we shall generate uh, answers as, because we're building theory. We are, we are, we are living theory. We are, we are those answers we're looking for, how we live it and work it out will know one day, maybe not now. So the direct question about um, elections and dictator Museveni uh, and whether or not I envisage a free and fair vote in Uganda in 2021. Look, we are working with a dictatorship. Yori Museveni, call him whatever one wants to, is a dictator. He's an authoritarian uh, old papa who has held on to power and refuses to let go. COVID-19 has given him a new lease on his military authoritarianism. And so the, the COVID-19 directives that we have got around the elections are really about frustrating political organizing, particularly for the opposition. I belong to an opposition party. It is criminal for us to have gatherings of more than five people. How do political opposition parties function in such an environment? The minute we have our organizing, we are arrested and thrown into jail. I've been thrown into jail five times. This weekend was the fifth time since the lockdown happened. And all that we're doing is really exercising our constitutional rights as members of the opposition, holding press conferences, protesting around the lack of food. And so what he has issued through the electoral commission that he has appointed, so the electoral commission is appointed by himself what he issued was a set of stringent rules that forbid any rallies and any meeting of voters. We have to do all our campaigns electronically on public media and on social media. The vast majority of the opposition don't have access to a space on TV or radio. Uh, social media, he's restricted the space. We now have to apply this month, they set a new set of directives where we have to apply for authorization. What are the chances that Stella Nyaz is going to be allowed to be on Facebook? She's going to get authorization to function uh, and criticize the government. There's hardly any. And I'm a privileged, relative privilege to other women who are uh, rural and don't have English to communicate and don't have the privilege of being in the opposition. Many of our women are in the independent uh, category of political uh, organizing. And so I want to celebrate South Africa because uh, we learned that their, their constitutional court, I think has allowed for independence because many women cannot participate in 
pos uh, political parties, the only opportunity for us is to organize ourselves independently. What are the chances of a free and fair vote for the presidential election? Nothing, unless Yuri Museveni dies of COVID-19 because it's a possibility. Unless that happens and it's a blessing, I don't see him letting go of power. The militarization of our politics, the monetization he's in the party primaries for his incumbent regime, there was a lot of money distributed to people to buy votes. And so sadly for the presidential position, in my head, I know that it is not going to be free, not going to be fair. I know he will be declared president come 2021. However, in my heart of hearts as a Ugandan who believes in liberation and who is a naive dreamer of all possibilities and I live in a world of utopia, I think that Yuri Museveni could go through social action, civil protest, we could protest and throw him out of state house. So not through the elections which he is managing and organizing, but perhaps through social protest. The question about women's issues and how we then ensure they're represented under such uh, a highly authoritarian uh, environment, one is for us to show up. And so although there are very few opportunities, I think that it's important to encourage as many women as possible to participate in the elections so that we are representing ourselves, we are representing women's issues. To try and be in touch with our communities is important. Um, and then I think to organize collectively as women, because unlike male participants, we don't have the finances, we don't have the social capital, we don't have the mentorship, the political capital. I think that the South African example of men meeting in political golf clubs, women's security is an issue. What happens at 10 p.m. when the political party has gone home and the men are going to a bar to take a beer or two, and I have to run home to take care of my, mother, my children? Um, th those questions, the, 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 the differentiation of gender for women and men participating in politics are important questions. The security of women actors in politics, while we are equal citizens, I think we are different and our security concerns must be taken on board. How that's wonderful, to... Stella, that's, yeah. that's wonderful. And I think that Thank really you. nicely sums up many of the issues that we're tackling and also gives us a sense of how we can maybe move forward and, and create some change and be hopeful about that change. Mbali, I, I recognize that I, you know, threw a lot of questions at, at all of you and, and please do be um, careful in picking which ones you choose because I think, uh, I suspect that we're going to run out of time very shortly. If um, we could talk about all of this stuff, I think for hours on end. And I think if it was up to me, I would love to continue this conversation, but for the, you know, to spare our audiences um, in case they need to go on to other things. Um, if you could choose maybe one or two questions to answer, I deeply appreciate that. Cheers. Sure, and I think I'll answer two questions you asked in one sort of answer. And one of the questions you asked is, how have we come to normalize the violence that we see in our society, both towards women, but in general, still a lot of the violence that we see and sort of what is the way that we go forward and what do we do to try and leverage our positions as women who to some degree are privileged to be able to have in these conversations. And for me, I think the way we've normalized that violence is because it is violence. And anyone that stands up in any country to say that they disagree with people who have the military behind them or who has state apparatus behind them to make you know, somebody die on the side of the road and nobody knows who she is, is something that's incredibly scary for anyone who would even dare to think that they could stand up. And until we have a system that doesn't allow the normalization of violence, particularly by the state against its own citizens, or even in political parties where dissenting voices are not allowed if it isn't what the current leadership of that party might say, you're going to continue having people scared, even if they agree that things need to change to be able to stand up because people have to think about their kids, you have to think about their own well-being, and it takes a lot to put your body on the line for something, even if you really fundamentally believe it. And for me, I've been thinking for many years that like um, uh, Stella was talking about, one, you need to have an intersectionality of groups that actually comes together because there's actually some sort of safety in numbers. But more importantly, these kinds of forums,
resources. I could speak more perhaps about what's happening in Uganda and I have, I mean, I've run anti-homophobia um, um, campaigns from South Africa about Uganda, perhaps more than Stella could. And we should be leveraging where we are and the kinds of things that we can say for our sisters or for the people that are fighting in our countries to try and help them. And in the same way, I could appreciate some support in South Africa on some of the issues that I'm trying to raise, some of the things that I'm trying to say need to change. And if they're raised by outside voices, I think they also carry some leverage of knowing that the world is watching you. So we shouldn't be having Zaneda being the only one who's talking about what's happening in refugee camps, what's happening to these women. I mean, I didn't even know about that video, but certainly I have enough of an audience in South Africa and enough of a platform to say, well, why hasn't even our government put pressure for the Mozambican governments to ask, how is this possible? How is this happening? When we all have these uh, African continent uh, pacts and treaties and deals that we've all signed about how important women are and, and, and et cetera. And I think going forward, we're gonna have to start leveraging that. And uh, thankfully technology and WhatsApp and social media is allowing us to have a lot more access to one another. But these kinds of forums are important because you feel that you have other people who are doing the same kind of work you're doing that you can call on for help. And whilst um, Dr. Leila is speaking about FGM and I'm speaking about virginity testing, while she's speaking about child marriages, here it's called Uktuala. It's the same kind of stuff that's happening. And maybe if I'm speaking about it as somebody who's Zulu, who's in the culture that's doing it, it seems to not have as much gravity as someone like her who could talk about it, who's a doctor, who studied this, who really could be given the... Um, ability to be seen to be objective about what needs to happen. And I really think that these are the kinds of forums, these are the kinds of things that we should be getting together as in terms of activists to try and leverage our platforms and our spaces to try and put pressure for each other. So now that I know what Stella is doing for the next couple of months as I run, I must also keep referencing her in my kind of um, election campaign. When I do my debates in a few weeks, I must say, and I'm privileged to be here, but Stella can't do this. And you know, that's how you get her name out there. That's how you get more people being aware of her struggle so that even in her own country, people can be galvanized to use her as a symbol of what they want to see changed. That's brilliant. And I think that's exactly right. I mean, there has to be a supporting of each other and then a trying to um, come together and, and boost each other's voices because it's often difficult to get those who are doing the oppressing to do that for us, right? So. Um, if we don't stand up for each other, then who will? Um, Leila, if you could, if you could choose some of the things, the many things that you'd like to comment on, even not even necessarily tackling the questions, but any kinds of um, reflections that you have. I keep forgetting to unmute myself. Just following on from all the points uh, my fellow panelists have said, I think I want to come back to the point. Um, uh, the same question that was just answered, how did we normalize violence? I think, again, historically, we need to go back. Somalis, we have a saying called Laga Barta, Laga Bacha, meaning you learn from them, you do better. So the reason this type of violence has become normalized, and if we speak with the context of Africa, because Africa was violated for a very long time. So we only know violence, we only know oppression. We haven't had the space to love and care and joy. Historically, that, that's part of our history, unfortunately, so we must recognize that. And again, I go back to that, that, what I said earlier, in terms of we have been groomed into this way, even when, those, when you're describing those men violating that woman in such a way, I promise you, those men, that's all they've ever seen in their life. That's all they know. I think we must really uh, keep that in mind at all times when we talk, about, especially when we talk about the African continent, because we do have this history of, colonization and slavery, which was all violence. So I think we must really keep in mind on that. But I also wanted to come back to that question, uh, just to continue with that question. You said, you know, it's really a difficult question. What's the answer? Is the answer very difficult? 18 years of doing this work, what I realized our education system plays a big role on why we continue with this. I promise you, I spent hours and years learning algebra did not do me any good. So I wish we could replace some of the stuff that we're learning in school. Can you imagine if children, and, and, and I'm including, because I want to connect this to the question about men. I think before they're men, they're boys. The behavior of men are learning from when they're boys. So we need to tackle this from a very early childhood. Just imagine if boys and girls were taught about their rights, were taught about their 
uh, about healthy and sex relationships. They were taught about finance because finance is something that we need every day and well-being, just those for because as human beings, we're not taught about how to take care of ourselves. If we taught that in as part of our curriculum, we will start to see changes and how, because these are learned behaviors that we're speaking about, by the way. Everything that we all describe, these are learned behaviors. In order to tackle, how do we start tackling these learned behaviors? We have to start very young. We need young people at childhood to learn, to unlearn these behaviors because those men who are shooting that woman in the middle of the street, the women who join Al Shabaab, these are all learned behaviors. And I think that really is a change that needs to happen. But coming back to spaces, you know, men need to be part of the conversation. Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a very proud feminist, but I, wanna, I want men to be part of this movement. You can't talk about equality and not have men in the conversation. We can't say men are evil and terrible and they are responsible for all the terrible things that happen in the world. Yes, the patriarchy is very responsible, but we need to have them on the table when we have this conversation. And we need to utilize the power men hold. They do hold power, we know that. So how do we utilize that power? However, we must be really careful that men don't occupy spaces of women also, because especially working in international development over and over, what I'm seeing, the jobs on women's organization are now taken by men. You don't even see women being hired in these spaces. So we have to be very mindful when we say we need men to be part of it, but it's, it's, it's to ensure, yes, men are part of it. They, they hold power, they need to be part of the conversation, but we must be careful they don't, don't so occupy spaces that women should be on. So, and, but I just want to come back to a point that was made earlier and I, I'll be very brief because I know we don't have enough time. All these conversations are extremely difficult but they must be had, it has to be had. But I think it's important we encourage ourselves, obviously these types of platforms, it's, it's a safe space. You know, for, I'm always saying, you know, we need to have very uncomfortable conversations but we need to create safe spaces to do that and we cannot have this cancel culture that we're seeing right now. That really worries me at the moment. It's really a big concern. We cannot cancel people just because they have a different view to us. I think we need to start creating spaces where we can have a conversation and come to some sort of understanding. And I would love to live in a world where we're all kind of, you know, and the, and, and the idea we keep saying, you know, women are second class citizen. I'm actually come to that, I come to that understanding that women are not even seen as human, human beings. We are not seen as human beings. And that is where we really need to start this. So we need to start from the solution that we need to actually see women as human beings. It's really sad that we constantly have to use that word, you know, women are human and they have human rights. It's, it, it's really sad that we're still at that stage, but in terms of solution, we need to go back to the foundation, which is our young people. Our education system is anti-women. We have to recognize that. In the UK, the clitoris organ is still not in the biology books. Unbelievable, isn't it? That's, that's the problem. The idea that a woman's, my body is not even on the biology books. That's how much I'm discriminated against in my own education system in the UK. So that's where the problems are. The idea that women are, uh, are, are seen as non-human, a second-class citizen, it starts within our education system. I think that's a, a really powerful point. Just thinking about children and boys in particular and, and mm -hmm. how we educate them. It yeah. is riven and rife within our system. And, yeah. and I think about that. It's, it's funny how becoming a mother makes you think about that, especially the mother of a, of a son. And, and I've had to rethink a lot of things about how I educate my child. And of course, the gender norms that I've got, you know, you transmit to your children oh, and, and many of them. We don't we even realize that we hold, right? So, Absolutely. you know, proud, avowed feminist that I am, I'm sure I am transmitting all sorts of gender norms that I actively am, am trying not to, but I do them very, very subconsciously. And I think, it, I think it's fine. I think we should be accepting of ourselves as you're suggesting, right? And, and to have the conversation about those things. Yeah. Um, Zenaida, would love to have you come in and, and reflect on some of, well, the many, many cup issues that we've been able to cover, but also the specific questions uh, that were directed at you. And feel free to be selective as well. Mm, I will be selective. <laughs> I will use the opportunity to do some sort of advocacy. Um, uh, and, and, um, and, and my selection this time goes to the question about how we change things. Um, in, in the specific case of Mozambique, I think, uh, one of the main problems has been identified. Um, it's, uh, of course, patriarchy and the whole idea that men decide, men will have the final word, and 
uh, women will be there to agree with men. Um, and, and it doesn't change anything by just putting more women in parliament or more women in government. Uh, and Mozambique has been praised over the years for, for being very good at creating that balance in parliament. But I keep wondering where are those women in parliament when things like this happen? And uh, for example, on the specific case of the video, I have not seen any politi women politicians speaking so far. Not one. In fact, I haven't even heard the first lady herself. So, which means they have deliberately made the decision to keep quiet. Uh, that must change. Um, the other point that is uh, also uh, relevant is the, is the question of impunity in Mozambique. Um, we, we have, as Human Rights Watch, and I know other organizations have done the same, documented cases of abuses that have never been resolved, have never been investigated. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if this case that we see in the video ends up the same way. Impunity is part of the so-called Mozambican culture. Uh, it's about let it go for as long as you have peace, uh, let's, let it just move on. And I think it has to do with the fact that it's a country that has suffered since independence of many wars, many conflicts, and people tend to look for peace rather than justice. So whenever they have posed with a question about what do you prefer? Do you prefer to just forget and forgive it and live well? Or do you want to pursue justice and face the consequences of pursuing justice, which might be revenge, uh, uh, hatred, and uh, enemies and distrust? Is that the road you want to take up? And therefore, those who sometimes advocate for justice, people like me, they are often seen as being on the other side. They don't seem to want peace. They don't want to seem to want the country to develop and to move on. They want the country to still be stuck on the same process. Uh, the problem with that is that over the years, it has created this environment of fear where uh, by people are scared of condemning, scared of criticizing, and the government uses that against us. If you look at how the government has responded to the equation of the women in the, being killed in the video, it's by spreading propaganda around the issue. They are not worried about identifying that woman, let alone punishing the soldiers that are there. Their main concern at this stage is to make sure that people do not believe that the people in the video are soldiers, period. And that is what their propaganda has always been about. I mean, you don't even see the Minister of Women and Social Affairs demanding for a full investigation on who is that woman in the video? Where is she coming from? Who is her family? Can we look for her family? Can we assist them? But that's her role, that's her task. She was appointed as Minister of, Just Minister of Women and Social Affairs exactly to take care of cases like that, but she's been silenced. Um, the, other, the other point is how society sees things. Again, it goes down to the point I just raised. Or what do you want? Do you want justice or peace? As if you could not live with the two of them. Um, my, all, my advice always to people who think about think that if they pursue justice, they can't have peace. My advice is always that they should look at the problem from the root and from the consequences that we'll have in the short, medium, and long period. We can't continue to look at the Mozambican conflict as if it was the other's problems. The same thing, for example, I would say to my fellow brothers and sisters in Zimbabwe, South Africa, or, or, or Zambia or Tanzania. You can't look at what is going on in Mozambique and think that ah, it's in Mozambique, it will never come this side. No, it's not true, it will. And uh, that, the way you are ignoring the victims in Mozambique right now, is the same way people will ignore you one day. Because the problem today is with that woman in the video, who could be mistaken by an insurgent Tomorrow when the conflict is in your area, it could be also in the same situation where it's difficult for the soldiers in your areas to distinguish between insurgents and innocent people. And you yourself who today are looking at it as far away could be the next victim. 
So look at conflicts like that. Today is that woman, tomorrow it could mean me. So fight to avoid the problem in the future. Now, your question about why is it not getting uh, more attention? I wish I knew the answer, Christine, but uh, I'm hoping that conversations like this will help us create our own networks of women that can spread the world and fight for our own rights. Because if we are going to wait on our governments to solve our problems, then we will get tired and die old sitting in our chairs, expecting them to do something. We have to remember all the time that just look around our region. Uh, all the people in leadership are men. And if you go deep to investigate their own lives outside politics, you'll be shocked by the number of things you'll find out about those men in power that we elected to be our leaders. So they have already that patriarchal, what we call complicity of protecting each other. It comes from being males outside of politics. And when they get to politics, that's what they do to each other. So. I, 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 I always say it's not true that the South African president has not called the Mozambican president about the video. He has. But he might have made that, you know, that bro call like, bro, come on, can you find the way of solving this issue without embarrassing us? And then the other one would say, I'm trying my best. And that's how men talk. So it's our time as women to take charge of our own problems and uh, or take charge of the ways to resolve our own issues. So thank you Mbali for suggesting that you will be spreading the word about the video. I'll make sure I tweet you and tag you next time. And uh, same goes to Stella and Leila and Mantati and Christine. Uh, let's us be the ones doing our own advocacy and try to change the situation of our sisters, mothers, uh, that, that are out there and cannot even uh, afford internet, let alone watch a, 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 an event like this um, that we are privileged of taking part. You are all an inspiration to me. Thank you so much for your thoughtful, insightful, just deeply emotional comments. I've, I'm gonna take it all to heart and Keep fighting. Mantate, back to you. Thank you so much, Christine, for facilitating this amazing session and for all those um, answers to the questions that we had. And thank you so much to our listeners as well for taking time to join us today. Thank you to our inspiring panel, as I said earlier on, you're all phenomenal. And the, res the response to the resistance bureau continues really to be overwhelming and it's humbling for us because truly it is always our amazing speakers, including those from today, who make this show what it is today. So don't forget to follow up with us on our website, theresistantbureau.com, and the to also subscribe for our newsletter there. After each episode, including today, we compile an extensive re reading list of relevant materials and resources that will, uh, will, that will allow interested folks to learn more. You can also stay up to date by visiting our social media platforms on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, where the Resistant Bureau. This show could not be the success that it's been if it wasn't for the team that put it together. Thank you so much, Professor Chisman and Jeffrey Smith for not just helping to bring this timely event to life, but also for noting the importance of letting women to own the conversation and to drive it. Resisting the patriarchy while a burden for both women and men challenges men to step aside and allow women to champion the narrative that truly reflect their experiences, both as victims and survivors, as well as to advocate for the kind of society that is more equal and safe towards women. Also a shout out to Peter Dory for all his work behind the scenes. We simply could not have done this without your support. Thank you everyone, enjoy the rest of your day. That's my data signing.